books, uh, turn to him 477, and we'll sing at Calvary. If you've had a rough week, this is a good chance to shake all that off and get your mind on the things of the Lord so that we can worship him in this next hour. Hymn 477. I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. By God's word at last my sin I learned. Then I trembled at the law I spurned. Till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me, there my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Now I've given to Jesus everything, now I gladly own him as my king. Now my raptured soul can only sing of Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to men. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Thank you. May be seated. I'm going to uh, pull out the prayer list. Oh, thank you. No, don't worry about it. Give Miss Kathy a round of applause with the prayer sheets. All right, all right, very good. I'll jump back over to this afterward. Um, but let's pull that out. And how's everybody doing tonight? Everybody into the new year and smiles on our faces, ready for the routine. <laughs> ready to see what 2021 holds, right? Just work through the um, uh, prayer list tonight um, before our time together in the Word. Um, and so we'll just work section by section from military personnel um, all the way over to health. And uh, we'll take a moment after we've um, made any additions, uh, made any subtractions. We'll take a moment or take a few minutes to just have prayer um, right where we are for that um, section, for people there just praying over the names. Um, of those folks praying for God's will in their lives, God's grace in their lives, and God's work to be done. Um, but before we do that, I, I just want to ask you um, to take a, a few minutes here before we start. Uh, prayer is an important thing. It really is. And uh, I know who I'm talking to, and I know you appreciate it and understand its importance in your life as a believer. Um, it is just talking to your Father. And I don't want to say just to make it seem like it doesn't, it's not important, but it is talking to your Father. It's a conversation with Him. And He's a holy God. 
I read this morning in Isaiah chapter 6, a familiar passage, that the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up. And he was holy, 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 was echoed in the temple, shook. And it made Isaiah realize who he was. And so sometimes we just need to take a minute, slow down, even with everything crazy going on around us, and realize who our God, who our God is and who we are. So do that for a few minutes here, and uh, then we'll uh, cover some of these sections. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have um, to gather together as many congregations have for millennia together in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, talking to you, our Father in heaven. And though we cannot see you with our eyes deep in your heart, deep in our heart, your presence we find. And we thank you that you're with us and you listen. God, if there be anything in our lives that we're resisting letting go and giving over to you. I pray that we just let go of it, that our hearts would be pure before you, our lives would be clean, and that we would uh, please you. Help us to confess sin and, and know that we have fellowship restored with you and, and our prayers can mean something. I pray that we'd have no greater joy in this life than to have fellowship with you, Father. Pray I would have no greater joy in this life than have fellowship with you. Would you bless now as we pray and as we go to work in prayer um, for these on the list with all kinds of different needs. We just pray that you would give us wisdom and grace to pray and, and to uh, be filled with your spirit and for this to mean something to us, Father, as we seek you on behalf of, the, on behalf of others. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, if you would, look at the uh, military personnel and college students. We'll just take that as one column, military personnel. And uh, I will read through these names. If there's any additions or subtract subtractions, um, um, indicate them along the way. We have Eugene Armstrong, Joe Armstrong, Joseph Bagley, Matthew Becker, Wallace Bonds, Tiffany Brower, I'm going to say Tiffany Brower, Matthew Burnett, Jonathan Farr, Davis Foster, Ben Guider. I would imagine that's Brother Dan relation. Son, okay. 
Christopher James, Christopher Kendall, Brandon Kendrick, Jimmy King, Damon Kirk, George Lewis, Jimmy Light, Joseph Loveless, Emily McCullough, Bobby Newton, Chantha Nye, Wilton Nye, Tyler Rector, Drew Shelley, Wesley Sparks, Jake Stallings, Asa Thurman, Brian Tenor. Did I get it? Tignor. Okay. All right. So the G is not silent. All right. Thank you. Brian Tignor, John Torbush, Bradley Werho, and Chad Womack. Any additions or specific requests with these military personnel? Okay. You never know what a change in administration is going to do to the military, so be definitely be in prayer for them with that. Um, and then our college students, uh, Cassidy Bryant, Audrey Hawk, Tyler Coster, Coster, right, Caleb Ruck, Jared Ruck, Aaron Strickland, Elena Strickland, Colin Thomas, Noel Thomas. Yes, ma'am. Take, take Elena off. Aaron's going to grad school. Leave him on there. Elena uh, does have uh, a job as a children's minister at a church in Alabama, out in Alabama. So be in prayer for her. That's a pretty awesome opportunity there. All right. Are there any additions here? Any college students have any concerns with what's ahead for you? We'll leave you on there. You need all the prayer you can get. We're definitely going to leave Cassidy on there. Amen. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. 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 Collier Griffin and Olivia McInvale in college. Great nieces. We'll be sure to be in prayer for them. You know where they are with the Lord, whether they're believers. Okay. All right. Very good. All right. Yes, sir. Jessica. Yes. Okay. Anybody else here? All right, let's just take a, a few minutes here and uh, pray for these uh, military personnel and college students, and uh, then we'll move on to the next section.
Father, we do pray for the men and women who serve in our armed forces and thank you for them and their commitment to making a career out of serving their country. We pray that you'd bless and protect each one, some on foreign soil. You'd bless and protect them where they are, strengthen their spirit. May they walk in your word and let your word saturate their lives and comfort them when they may be far from home and family. Pray for grace upon their lives with the transition of administrations. Just pray that uh, you would help them, um, Lord, adjust to what may change um, in their lives. And I pray that they would do so with grace and honor, Lord, as they continue to serve. Pray for each and every one of our college students who are, are, are those continuing with training and education. You give them grace to help them learn the skills that they need, the specialty skills and the technical skills. God, the, the life skills that you would be glorified through their lives as they embark into different professions and trades. Pray that the gospel would be everything to each and every one of them, Lord. They'd love you and they'd make a difference um, wherever you guide their vessel. God, would you bless them. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Let's uh, look here at the special requests. Um, I'll read through this and if there's anything uh, that needs to change. Um, we will, and then at the close of this, um, or once we have uh, all the names down, I'll ask Brother Richard in a minute to pray over this. Um, but Terry and Patsy Arp, continue to pray for them. I spoke with him today a little bit, and uh, or yesterday I think it was, and he actually shared with me a request that I will get to here in a minute um, about somebody else. But uh, they, they're doing well um, under the circumstances with COVID and everything. They're just hoping things work out with the vaccines and get out and uh, be out and about. Uh, at some point, he told me that uh, when all this clears up, we need to get together and have some peanut butter and jelly. So I'm going to hold him to that. Um, you know, I'm looking forward to that. I really appreciate him. But be, be in prayer for them. God bless them. And, um, you know, God takes care of his own. And he certainly takes care of his servants, that's for sure. But uh, he deserves double honor and I would say double prayer in that sense. So let's be in prayer for um, Pastor Art, uh, Dr. Gary Bartholomew, Walt Baxter, Grant Boyd, be in prayer for him. They're still looking for answers. Uh, the ENT uh, was yesterday and still getting some referrals, um, getting more information about that diagnostics, Pops, possibly a biopsy. Uh, definitely going to get a biopsy. Just wasn't yesterday. Right. Mm. Yeah. Right. So pray for that um, with the biopsy and everything, that that would go smooth, everything. They'd find some answers there that can solve some of those issues. All right. Um, anything else with that? Okay, good. All right. We'll be in prayer definitely for Brother Grant. We want to see him back with us. I saw an old picture of him with that. I think it was at some shores or something. I don't know. She put on Facebook. And I mean, you know, big old guy, you know. It's like, man, love to see him like that again. Let's pray that way. Um, Lauren Campbell, Michael Cologne, Mr. and Mrs. Eric Cologne, Holly Conley, Linda Cook, Jennifer Culpepper, Sandy Culpepper, Tim Culpepper, Debbie Ellington, Melissa Irvin, Scott and Angela Griffith, Diane Groff, Holly Hawk, Richard Hawk, Crystal Hensley, Donna Howard, Francis Hunt, Mimi and Christopher Kimball, Odessa Coster, Vicki Kubiak, pray for her mother, uh, Marjorie. Um, is not doing all too great. She's been sending updates. Um, I think she went to the hospital with pneumonia. I might have to double check. Yeah, you're saying, yeah, okay. Um, but uh, not in a great place right now. And so pray for her. Miss Vicki is real sh trust in the Lord and uh, strong in the Lord, been taking care of her mother for a while. And so pray for them. Marilyn and John Lemon, Lehman, Edward Martin, Miss Cheryl Maslinkowski. You're doing good. Okay, going to go back in Monday for the surgery. 
or for an additional surgery there. So we'll pray for that. That goes well. We want her to be full, full throat so she can get after Brother Robert like he needs it, you know. Uh, Hope McKenzie, Sharon McKenzie, Kelly Moberly, Menar Moore. You want to try? Okay, Menar. All right, Victor and Weena and I, Pastor Art mentioned these folks yesterday. Victor is a former member here, from what I understand. Um, I'm not sure where they are now, but Pastor Art got a phone call. They live somewhere else in the state, but Pastor got a phone call yesterday, I think from Brother Victor's son, that he had a stroke, and it is not looking very good. Um, so be in prayer for them um, as well, and uh, waiting to hear back more information through Pastor um, about that situation. Jim Phillips. Bill Pitts, Tom and June Round, Deborah Scott, Diane Thomas, Paul and Shannon Thomas, Terry Thompson, Ken Tomlin, Tiffany Walker, Michael Whitcomb family, Van and Joanne Whitlock, Kevin Wingo, Shane and Britannia Wright, Damian April, No and Aaliyah. Okay, any to add here to the special requests or subtractions? Okay. Any? Uh, let's just do this um, as well. Are there any any additions or subtractions we made through the health? I won't read through this section, but just look through that quickly. If there's any additions or subtractions, yes, sir. Okay. Jim Norris. Okay. Okay. Um, right under his name, I did see Miss Sandra. Be sure to continue to be in prayer for her as she walks through this difficult time. Yes, ma'am. Hmm. Man, was she caring for him or? Okay. Gotcha. What's, do you know their son's name? Mr. Ben, Mr. Benson. All right. I'll just put Mr. Benson. That'll work. <laughs> when you remember at 3 o'clock in the morning, don't text me, okay? All right. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> okay. All right. Miss Terry, yes, ma'am. Very good. Okay, good. Good. I believe Miss Linda is um, on this list. Over, yes, be, we continue to be in prayer for her and her recovery. Okay. And I think she's doing pretty well. I want to understand just some pain and whatnot. So. Any others here? Yes, ma'am. Okay. What's your sister's name is? Sandra Cannon, okay. Sandra Cannon, correct, and she she's in the hospital with heart issues. So. Okay, okay. All right, so um, an uncle. Gary or Gene Shiflet is in ICU. His blood pressure bottomed out. Been suffering with pneumonia. A lot of a lot of issues there. And then her sister has not been admitted, but she's at the hospital 
um, with heart issues, and her name's Sandra Cannon. Okay, Sandra Cannon and Jean Shifflett. Okay, any others here? Yes, ma'am. Right. Be in prayer for Mark Thomas. Um, many health issues with Parkinson's, just got over COVID. And uh, just with all the issues with the church, you know, and feeling the need to retire. Um, and we've been down these roads before. And so be in prayer for this sister church up in uh, Pennsylvania, Catanning. That really is Catanning? Okay. All right. <laughs> Mind blown. All right. Let's do this. Um, Brother Richard, if you would pray for these. Um, um, that best you can by your memory and then I will uh, pray um, that God would use us as we go out the rest of this week to be a good uh, gospel witness and to love people right where we are and uh, pray that God give us opportunity to to uh, show Christ to others so brother if you would just pray for these needs these physical needs and then I'll pray before we get into our message
Father, we have a sobering responsibility to take your gospel and live it before the world and share it with boldness and compassion. And God, I know my own life that many times I miss opportunities where I don't make opportunities because I'm just not walking in your spirit and sensitive to the moving of your spirit. And Lord, the single greatest thing that we could do for the souls of the men and women of our country is what we're doing right now. And out of this, Lord, we pray that we would go from here and be a light in the remainder of this week. That no matter what the future holds for the United States of America or for Georgia, for our county or our towns, that we would be what you want us to be. And the gospel would be everything to us. And we would do what we can to proclaim it to others faithfully. God, would you give us courage and strength? Give us a heart like the Savior and the backbone like a railroad tie to just stand strong for you and be a light and be what you want us to be. Follow you faithfully, Lord. And bless this time in your word. I pray you bless our marriages. And God, I pray that you would strengthen the couples in this church and the future couples and help us all Lord, to learn the lessons we need to learn about love and about discipleship and about being what you want us to be. Would you work in our lives through your words? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, Genesis chapter 1, I'm going to switch over here. All right. Well, Genesis chapter 1, I'm going to switch over here. Have a little mobility here tonight. Genesis chapter 1, we're going to do a series through January. Um, on Wednesday nights, and tonight we'll start with marriage at the foot of the cross. Next week, January 13th, it'll be you, love her, you, respect him, some decency and order in the uh, marriage relationship. And the next week after that, it'll, it'll be uh, the second part of that um, combo in the marriage vows, or for worse. What do we do in marriage when things work out for worse? Or for worse, that'll be on the 20th. And then finally on the 27th will be the cherry on top. The cherry on top. And the cherry on top makes me think of bliss in a bowl. An ice cream sundae. Yeah. Maybe for you it's a bland, b uh, banana, a banana split. Maybe that's the case. Um, you know, bliss in a bowl. But, you know, whatever happened to wedded bliss in modern times... Um, it's anything but bliss. Divorce is popular and cohabiting seems even more popular. Commitment, what's that? And people are seeking bliss and romantic and companion relations, either as a spouse or a lover or a partner, however it's defined anymore. And it seems to be that it doesn't happen, that bliss doesn't happen between a man and a woman for life. At least it seems that way if you listen to the narrative that's going on. Now, the Bible disagrees with that. Notion Just right off the bat, the Bible still says that he that findeth a wife findeth a good thing. A good thing. Obtaineth favor of the Lord. That's Proverbs 18.22. And Solomon exhorted everybody in Ecclesiastes 9.9 to enjoy the wife of your youth. To enjoy it. Paul said in the New Testament that marriage is honorable in all. In all things, marriage is an honorable thing. So even still, though, when the Bible disagrees with the modern sentiment, relationships are still shattered, and lives are still ruined, and people are still seeking a better alternative to traditional marriage. Whatever happened to wedded bliss? Now, that word honorable in Hebrews 13.4 is where that comes from. It comes from the Greek word timios. It means valuable. I think of something valuable in relation to marriage. I think of a wedding ring. I, uh, um, I'm not going to... Okay, I often joke. When I bought my wife's wedding ring, at that time I was driving down on the weekends to Texas um, to do a, a part-time ministry internship there, and I would pass by the biggest casino 
in Texas. So I joke, that's how I bought her wedding ring. But that's not how it did, okay? That's not how I did. Um, but it's a valuable thing. It's a, her wedding ring is a, a, a valuable thing. It meant something to her. I was thankful in nerves. I didn't drop it off the bridge there going over I-35 in Oklahoma City, the one with the, the bird that lights up and all that. I, I have a video I'll show you sometime. Um, maybe not. Um, but anyways, it, a wedding ring is a valuable thing. I don't know if you've ever seen the Christian movie Fireproof about marriage. Excellent, excellent uh, film about marriage. I get choked up when I watch that one. Um, and I remember that um, the doctor there, the bad doctor, okay, he's the bad guy, right? He's trying to woo that um, the wife, the fireman wife's heart. And at some point after the the hero of the film, the fireman, he's got his heart right. He's trying to win her heart back, and he goes in there and he he has that wedding ring on, and he's like, it fits fine, you know, and across the desk, and that doctor. He, when, when the fireman leaves, Kirk Cameron, when he leaves, the doctor opens a drawer, and in his desk, what does he pull out? He pulls out his wedding ring, and he looks at it, and he shakes his head and puts it back in the drawer and shuts the drawer. Well, I just want to ask you, are you leaving your ring in a drawer? Okay, it's a valuable thing. <laughs> now, someone might literally be doing that just for convenience. I don't know. Anyways... But it's a legitimate question. In modern times, traditional marriage is something to be left in a drawer and shut. Something to brush off. Something that's not valuable. But the Bible says that traditional marriage is something to prize. It's something to take care of. It's something to highly value. It's something to carry with you. Okay, but maybe you're struggling though. Maybe marriage isn't the bliss that you had expected it would be. Like a lush garden where there's perfect harmony and harp music in the background. Or perhaps... <laughs> <laughs> a cabin getaway. Thanks, Robert. Mr. Robert, sorry. A cabin getaway, right? In Pigeon Forge. The snow's falling and everything's perfect and the fire's blazing and there's no kids for miles. Can't even hear them. Maybe a bear, not a child. But marriage isn't bliss like that. Maybe marriage is bad. I mean, even on our honeymoon, I said something incredibly stupid one day in and. Bliss went to bad, and God recovered us. Praise Him. It's the first time we ever heard that song we sang here, actually. Why can't we, if, if He can love someone and find the good within? That's when we heard that song, and um, God is good. But maybe you still live there from time to time. Marriage is bad. Zero harmony, zero happiness, zero hugs, or anything else. It's bad. Maybe marriage is blah. It's not bad, but it's certainly not bliss. Um, you have good days, but mostly blah. You know, you think of a bonfire, you know, they go camping and you light a bonfire and it gets warmth, warm enough for some people to do something really dumb and char their hot dogs and their marshmallows. I mean, who would do that? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And then for those normal people to get the right, you know, and it's warm enough to do that, but then you leave and you go to other things and the, you come back, the fire's kind of died down. You got to do what? You've got to stoke it. You've got to put wood on the fire, but maybe you're just, I'm tired of adding wood to the fire. This is getting, this is getting routine. It's getting rote. It's just, it's just blah, and maybe it's just work to you. Well, we would all love the bliss. In modern times, people are after bliss, and they have claimed to have found it outside the traditional way of commitment, one man, one woman for life, and maybe you wish you had bliss again. Well, rest assured, God is a God of relationships. God is a God of relationships. In 1 John 4, the Bible says that God is love. It's his very nature. He's three in one. He is perfect love. He is relational. He's all about gathering. He's all about get-togethers. He's all about table time and date nights and weekends away with your best friend. He's about relationships. And God made mankind to be relational. And Genesis 1 it begins to guide our thoughts biblically on this matter. If you look in verse 26, it says, And God said, Let us, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. 
So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And 28 goes on to say that God blessed them and he told them to be fruitful, multiply and fill the earth with people and have dominion over every living thing that moveth upon the earth, over the fish and the, and the fowls. And then Genesis 2 develops what was already said about man in chapter 1. Okay, so it's like if I said, hey, I got married to my lovely Liza Jane. We're going to serve the Lord for the rest of our life. Let me tell you the story. That's kind of what he does. He talks about how he created man on the sixth day, and then he gets into more details, tells the story, how that all came to be in chapter 2. So look at chapter 2 and verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. And we need to be reminded of that. We get so full of ourselves. We're just dust. We're going to end up to be dust in a box by the time it's all said and done. At least this body. Thankfully, the Lord gives us life eternal. But the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And we are told in verse 15 that God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden so he would take care of that. His responsibility was over the animals. He had dominion over the animals. And then he had further, more specific responsibility to take care of Eden. And he, we, we know the uh, rule that God gave him there, the freedom, but then the, just the one rule. But then in verse 18, God said, It's not good that the man should be alone. I will make an help meet for him. And so God started um, making all these different animals. And he would bring them to Adam and see what Adam would call them. He gave them the freedom to exercise his responsibility and and Adam was made in the image of God so he was creative and Adam named the animals but out of all those animals not a single animal was meant for Adam and can I put a plug here as well there wasn't another man around either so a man couldn't have been meant for meant for Adam to be a help meet for him either and so God sees that he's alone and he he gets into anesthesiologist mode and he puts Adam into a deep sleep and he goes to work, pulls out a rib, he sews him back up, and he makes out of that rib a woman. And you hear the song, matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match. And there she is, and Adam wakes up, and he's like, whoa, man, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. In verse 24, it says, the... The uh, comment that the, the writer of Genesis says, This is the reason, therefore, shall a man leave his father and his mother. Because of how God worked and how God brought them together and brought the woman out of Adam, this is why a man leaves his father and his mother and cleaves to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. That's why that happens. That's why they become their own home and their own family and their own unit, because they are truly one. Father and mother are one. And the product of that is a son. And because of the way God set it up, when that son leaves the nest, he starts his own. Because they are now one. That's what he's saying in verse 24. And Jesus gave this the check mark, the, the thumbs up. He liked this in Mark 10, 9. He said, What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. And while we may not do that legally, God help us not to do it practically either. Cause division in our marriages. And then verse uh, 25, they were both naked and not ashamed. And that is good for a married life. And we'll cover that later with the cherry on top lesson for sure. That is God's design. We know, though, that Genesis 3 happened and problems entered real fast. Serpent tempts the woman. A woman wants the fruit. The woman gave the husband the fruit. Adam ate. <laughs> Crash. Man sinned. If man was made to be like a mirror made in the image of God to reflect God uh, as the creation, Adam, by choosing to take of that fruit and to take a bite, it's like he took a sledgehammer and crash, shattered the mirror of the image of God. It shattered it. And relationships just got interesting, and responsibilities just got difficult, and relationships just shattered. Responsibilities just got thorny, but God in His grace, and as He always does, He sought out the rebels... Man blamed the woman, the woman blamed the serpent, and the serpent didn't have a leg to stand on. God cursed the serpent, and we're thankful for the promise of Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. That was eventually fulfilled by Jesus. We're going to get there, Lord willing, here soon. 
But I want to focus on verses 16 through 19 for now and shed light upon the developing relationship issues between the first man and the first woman. If you notice, in verse 16, under the woman he said, I will multiply, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. And sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. Labor, pregnancy is hard because of the decision Eve made. It's difficult. And whereas before she was one with Adam and she was a help meet for him and they would be fruitful and multiply, they would still do that. But before Adam's dominion was over the animals, the flesh, the fowls, watch this. But in verse 16 it says, And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Biblical order. Okay, so that began there. Who thinks Eve got what she want when she bit that tasty looking ego stroking fruit? And dear women, do you still think you need to know everything and have your husband go along with everything that you want? How did that work for Eve? Notice what God said to Adam at the beginning of verse 17 though. He says, and unto Adam, he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, because you've not, not just in the sense that he listened to some advice or some counsel, some domestic issue. No, his wife encouraged him to do something that directly, that directly contradicted a command of God. And he listened to her and he responded to her and he went along with her. And because of that, mankind has been cursed ever since that day because a man followed his wife rather than following God. A man listened to the voice of his wife rather than the voice of God. And because of that, work is hard. And death is a cold, hard fact. And pregnancy and labor hurts all because a man said yes to her and no to him. Responsibilities are challenging. Relationships are broken. And it all goes back to Adam's decision not to obey the voice of God. And ever since then, we've struggled to obey the voice of God when it comes to relationships with each other, particularly marriage. We can talk a lot about the relationships within the church, and we cover that a lot, but... Marriage is really where many of the problems begin. And it's where many modern problems are. And I told a friend recently that if I am not a disciple up on the home on that hill, and in this relationship right here, if I'm not a disciple right here, I am not a disciple. If I'm not following Jesus, when, I, when my feet hit the floor in the morning and... Life begins in the Springer household. If I'm not a follower of Jesus and looking like Jesus and serving like Jesus and loving like Jesus there, I can pretend all I want when I see you, but I'm no disciple. Do you struggle obeying God's voice in your marriage? Let me just give you some of my struggles. I sweat the small stuff. Hey, the toilet paper goes over the top and all the toothpaste gets squeezed from the end. Okay, I'm just kidding, of course. But I do sweat the small stuff at times. I get impatient. I choose to have a temper. It's a choice. Tempers don't happen to you. You choose to have them. There's no such thing as righteous indignation, biblically. Anger is the boiling over of your spirit. And it's your choice what you do in response. I ruin date nights. I expect too much at times. I don't always love like I should. I can be a taker more than a giver. Can you believe that? A millennial can be a taker more than a giver? I can do that in my marriage. What about you? Here's some common things in marriage. She didn't do this the way I wanted her to. Well, he doesn't pitch in and ever help do the things he wants done. She won't just leave me alone. He didn't acknowledge my haircut. Does she think she's in charge of this home? If he would just do something, maybe I wouldn't take charge. She's still upset about something. I can't even remember I did. He doesn't care how what he did affected me. She won't stop talking. He never listens. She never wants to, you know. He always wants to, you know. What's your struggle? Are you picking up the sledgehammer and your relationship with your spouse and continuing to shatter the reflection of God you ought to be? And we're going to see that Christ restores the image of God in our lives. Christ came and he was the perfect image of God. And if you believed in Jesus, that image is restored on you and it's to be restored on a daily, day, daily basis. But you might be taking out your little tinker hammer 
Or you may just be taken out the sledgehammer. You might not even be in beating around the bush. And you might just, as soon as you wake up, you're all in. Boom! And you're shattering the image that they are made. Shattering the image that you were meant to be. Let's just say this is a good thing that Jesus came. It's a good thing that he was born of a virgin and is the perfect son of God and lived a perfect life, perfect in his relationships to God and man. And he loved God with everything he had. And the love he showed to the Father was the love he shared with the world. As Romans 5, 8 tells us that even when we were sinners, even when we were awful at loving others like we should, God demonstrated he showed his love to us and died for us. Jesus took everything we deserve. He was betrayed by one close to him and abandoned by the other eleven. Because of our sin, our failures in our relationship, we deserve to be betrayed and abandoned by those closest to us. Jesus Christ was falsely accused and sent to death. But because of what we've done, we deserve more than a false accusation. Jesus Christ was greatly mocked and stripped down naked and paraded for all to see. Because of our sins, of how we treat one another, we deserve humiliation. We deserve scorn. We deserve being mocked. Jesus Christ was spat upon and punched in the face and had his beard ripped out and whipped to a bloody pulp and nailed to an old rugged rugged cross to die. And because of our failure, because of our selfishness, because of our obsession with ourselves and our relationships, we deserve that. We deserve what he took. He cried as he died on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And we deserve to be forsaken even by God because we are so full of the person we see in that shattered mirror. Jesus knows what it is to feel abandoned, unwanted, and betrayed. He knows perfectly. Jesus came to take the full brunt, the full force, to drink the full cup of God's wrath against our sin, against our failure and our relationships with Him and with man. And because He gave Himself, we can be forgiven. If you believed in him, you are. Romans 4 verse 25 says that he was delivered for our offenses. All those things that happened to him were were done so that we could be forgiven of our offenses. And we are very offensive. We can be very offensive. And we might not see it as such. And, and our spouse may overlook some things because they're gracious. And they're, at least they, they want to come across gracious. Uh, we are offensive. It's who we are. It's in our nature. And we try to solely ourselves up. And we try to butter the biscuit and make it look good. But we, by our very nature, offend one another on a regular basis. But he was delivered for our offenses. And our marriages. And our families. But he was raised again for our justification. We're guilty. Deserve condemnation. Eternal death and hell, but he came back to life so we could be declared the slate is clean. Every offensive thing you've ever said, done, or thought in your marriage is wiped away. If you believe in Jesus, it's true of you. So, so, so though Adam shattered the image he was to be, Christ saved it with his perfect, never-ending life in submission to the Father. Though Adam ruined the relationships, man was meant to have Christ reconciles them all by his death on that tree. And though Adam made all the responsibilities and problems that man has on earth just complex, Christ makes us complete in him so we can live the life he wants us to live and do the things he wants us to do. Relationships are made right by Jesus. I don't have to get jealous I don't have to spoil my relationships. I don't have to sweat the small stuff, get impatient, throw a fit, ruin a date night, be a taker. I don't have to get frustrated with how she did X, Y, Z or how he didn't do anything at all. Or I don't have to wish she'll just leave me alone or he'll just glance at me once. I don't have to go on autopilot and let her lead or step into the cockpit because he won't. I don't have to worry about the past if I have dealt with it. Or if I don't have to hang on to his past because Christ has dealt with it. I don't have to 
ignore her need to talk. Or I don't have to drive him crazy when he really doesn't want to. I don't have to continue to shatter the relationships I have in my marriage. Or in my family or anywhere else. I don't have to do that. Because relationships are made right by Jesus. God says marriage can be bliss. God says marriage is valuable. God says marriage is blessed. And we know this. So how do we keep our marriage there? The blissful life. Just life. Thriving marriage life. How do we keep it there? Well, your marriage won't have life if you don't have death. You keep your marriage there by keeping your marriage there at the foot of the cross. We cannot, we must not divorce marriage from the cross. The cross is the only sure way of a healthy, eternally rewarding, satisfying, presently marriage right now. And what does it look like? What does it feel like to keep my marriage at the foot of the cross? Well, start here. You stay there. You stay there. Remember the first time you heard the gospel of Jesus? The first time you, you beheld in your mind's eye and in your imagination, the Spirit of God stirred your heart and you beheld with, with a broken heart the, the suffering Son of God hanging on that tree and all the agony and all the shame and all the embarrassment. And you realize the reason He was there is because that's what you deserved. But He did that willingly because He loves you. And you embraced it. And you found total forgiveness. And you were set free. Imagine the feeling of peace. The feeling of joy. Nothing else in the world mattered. You didn't need anything else just to know that, wow, I've, I have a God who loves me. I have a God who lives in me. I have a God who rose again so this life can be possible. And you know what the Bible teaches? That when you believe the gospel, that when you place your faith in what happened on that cross, that that cross now becomes yours that if you want to follow Jesus it is a daily choice to do what to take up that cross and follow him Paul said I am crucified with Christ I am dead to myself read Romans 6 we were dead we're buried with him in baptism unto death we're dead to and what we're what are we dead to we're dead to sin all the offensive things that we are and we feel and we think and we do in our marriage we are dead to those those things are dead they're they're wrapped up they're mummified they're put in a casket they're put in the ground they're dead and though they feel very much alive they're dead and that cross is our cross and those things and those actions they are dead. And we are alive in Jesus. Because He is alive. We live. And His life should characterize ours. What does His life look like? I didn't bring it with me, but I, I thought about bringing my bowl and my towel. You know what it means to let Christ live in me? It means picking up a towel. It means picking up a towel in my marriage every day. You say, well, I've been serving her a long time. And I just don't know if I can do it anymore. It's just too hard. Now, Jesus would suggest that if that is how you feel, maybe you weren't serving her like he had modeled to begin with. Because he said, if you do these things, happy are ye. You know what the word for happy is? It's the same as in the Beatitudes from what I understand. Same as I don't know, bliss bliss you can be in the worst relationship 
on the face of the planet. You can be in the worst job on the face of the planet. You can be in the worst situation on the face of the planet where everybody else around you is just breathing down your throat. But if you are living the life of a disciple and that cross is yours and you are living as Christ would have you live and I'm not here, I'm not in this for me. I'm in this for them because I'm in this for him. If you're living that way, you can have joy all the time. Because it's not about you. And if that's the case with you, my friend, and if that's the case with her, what greater opportunity do we have in Christian marriages to have lives full, bubbling over with the joy of Almighty God? Well, what it takes is a man that says, I'm 100% at the foot of the cross. So I'm 100% given to her. This isn't give and take. This is 100% give. And on the other side of that, you have a wife who says, because I am 100% here, I'm 100% given here. This isn't give and take. This is give. And when you have two disciples who recognize that I am dead to myself, but I am alive unto Jesus, and I can do what's right here, that's a good prospect for wedded bliss. You won't find the world over. You have a wonderful opportunity to follow the Lord. So just follow Jesus this week. I encourage you, and I'm just burdened in my own heart and life. You know, uh, we get busy with things in the church and settling in here and trying to keep everything balanced. It's easy just... It's easy just not to be mindful about these things, but we need the reminder that if we are disciples of Jesus, we stay at the foot of that cross. We stay there. We stay there. We stay there. And we keep loving. And that'll keep it going. That'll keep it going. Okay? Let's stand together and close in a word of prayer. Brother Tommy Hawk, if you wouldn't mind closing in a word of prayer, that'd be great.